when I was younger, I remember going down to Galveston and being on the seawall with a, a close family friend, uh, the parent of a close family friend. And it was sunset and she looked out at the sun and she said, this, this is what my boys don't know how to appreciate. This is what my boys don't know how to look at. They see it, but they don't see it. And I looked at the sunset and I really looked at it. I broke it down and I took that moment to reflect in on myself and on my day. And I, I truly think that this was the first time in my life where I truly used my observation skills. And that's what we're talking about today. This is the Teach Bigger podcast. Welcome to the Teach Bigger Podcast. I'm Chris Pratt. I'm Chris Mosley. And I'm Tyler Lamond. So today's episode is actually an extension and it's the second part of a previous episode that we did called The Hidden Power of Observation. And in the last episode, if you haven't listened to it, I would encourage you to check it out because we kind of talk about the power of observing other teachers and what we can learn from our colleagues and from just sitting in on classrooms and really observing the practice that goes on from other professionals as well as the room itself and the students in the room so that we can take it back to our classroom and improve what we're doing. But in this episode, we want to extend that thought of observation beyond the idea of just observing a classroom and we want to look a little bit deeper into how can we observe in a meaningful way and the power that it can give us to shape our thinking and our processes in our classroom. So the first thing that we want to look at is that observation can go into social and emotional aspects. And so whenever you start thinking about what can you observe in the room beyond the physical things and the actions and the words that are being said, but can you look deeper and look beyond those things into the meaning and the, the thought behind it all? So there's a lot of power in that. And so the first thing that I would encourage you to start to do is start to observe student behavior, right? When we start to observe our students, it gives us a lot more insight into why they do what they do, how they do it. So both on an academic level and a social level. So we're going to kind of break this down for a minute. And I want us to think, guys, about experiences you've had and some takeaways that you've had whenever you've observed your students, you know, a lot of times as teachers, we react, you know, a kid misbehaves, so we immediately discipline, you know, we immediately redirect the behavior. But sometimes it's a matter of just stopping and watching what is going on. And then that gives you some clues and some insight into why it's going on. So mostly I'll let you get it started. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, this was brought to my attention. So I consider myself an observer, like I watch people, whether they be my students or just people in general, just behaviors and um, how they interact and how they respond to different things. And I do it um, on an analytical level. Like I try to see, okay, they did this because of this. Why do why do they respond this way? And I, I've kind of always done it just kind of as a, a habit. And it was brought to my attention by one of my colleagues this year, um, who's a second year teacher. Um, but we just kind of said, okay, so like, Tell me what you've noticed about me. And this is something he brought to my attention. He said, um, one, he said, you give everyone like 100% of you. Like, it doesn't matter if it's for a little bit. If someone's coming, you're like, give them all your attention. That's one. I'm like, oh, okay. And the second thing he's, he says is like, when someone does a certain action, he said, you look beyond the action and then you try to get to the bottom of it. And which helps, helps address the issue. I said, yeah, the older I've gotten... You know, like if a kid responds a certain way, uh, then I know that it's, you know, it's for a reason. You know, it could be out outlying problems or underlying problems. And we just have to get to the root of that to really solve the problem. So uh, and he says and he talked about how much that helped him, because as a young teacher, you just see the surface, but you're just trying to make it. And so I was trying to tell him, hey, if they, if they do this, they respond a certain way or they're unattentive or something like that sometimes. It's way more than that because it's not just our class. So a good example of that was um, I was in my office typing away one day and then he brings this girl in, right? And her arms come, they're folded, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, he's frustrated because he got frustrated really quickly. And then um, I'm like, 
hey, you know, I, I, I know she's like throwing a fit and I know she's also a ninth grader. So she's trying to do it for some reason or whatever. And uh, so I'm like typing and then I, I look over at her. I'm like, hey, girl, what's up, girl? You know, like that. Uh, because, you know, she's in my office because she did something wrong. But I'm 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 like not addressing the fact that she's in trouble. I'm just talking to her like normal, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then he's like, well, we have an issue. I'm like, oh, OK. I was like, tell me what's going on, you know. Uh, and I keep typing. So it's like not a big deal, you know. And she's like, he's trying to get me to do this and do that. And I'm like, and it has something to do with like pointing at the music, you know. And I'm like, oh, really? And then she said, yeah. You know, there's a saying that, you know, you can take a horse to the water, but uh, if it doesn't want to drink, you can't drink, you can't make it drink or something like that. You know, she said it that way. And what I did at that moment, like, I just bust out laughing. I laughed so hard. I laid my head on the desk and I like throw myself back in the chair. Right. (laughs) And I was like, really, really? Is that it? And then at the end of that moment, she laughed. I was like, okay, okay, okay. I was like, I'm sorry. And he was surprised that I did that. But I knew she was doing that for some other reason, you know? Uh-huh. And so she was really upset. Like, she didn't know how to respond. Then she started to smile. And I'm like, okay, really? What's going on? I was like, did you have a bad weekend? And she was like, yeah. And then she started going through the whole weekend stuff. I was like, oh, well, that's the issue. I was like, don't get mad at him. I was like, if you had that, like, tell him. Like, we're just doing, you know, the things that are going to make you successful here. And then we got through that. And then it was fine. And he was so shocked. He was like, I can't believe that you laughed at her. I said, yeah, because I understood that it was something more than just what was on the surface. She was just doing that because of how she felt about something else. And she didn't really know as a you know teenager how to work through that, her emotion. So I just looked deeper into the problem. And I kind of helped circumvent it by not responding to her emotion. You know, mm-hmm. and I just came at it from like a calm, centered place. And I just, you know, kind of blocked it, you know. And it was really surprising because I don't think a lot of teachers are able to do that. I just took myself out of it, you know, and then we fixed it and then moved on. But he always talks about how that changed his perception on how to deal with kids' behavior. So that's a that's a story. There you go. I, I okay. So what I took away from that is that you didn't respond to their emotion, and exactly. I I think that is like really really big. Now I'm not saying that you should never respond to their no emotion. no no no. You have to read the read yeah. the situation. You, you got to read the situation because like I have a student who um is is they for whatever reason they think that they can't trust teachers and he in his mind he's like i'm here to work i'm here to only do my work and Mm -hmm. i suspect that he was always an iss or oci or dap like a situation where he was always in a very quiet room he was handed work after work after work and he just got it done and he probably learned was very successful at that and remember uh one of the greatest teachers i've ever known told me any any kid and really any person will put up with any type of crap any day of the week if they've associated with success with success mm-hmm. any kid will put up with anything as long as they've associated with success that's why coaches and band directors get away with yelling at their kids because they go out and win but anyway the point is is that when he's always on his phone and like I w- he was he was on his phone and I was like hey look man I don't want to take your phone and he was like you're not taking my phone and I was like, wow, like if there's a moment that a kid's going to hit me, like he's literally going to fight me for his phone. And I was like, look, dude, like you do really good work in here. You're all about doing work. Let's just not get distracted and it won't be an issue. You know, like let's just get back to being work. And so and I think he was waiting and expecting me to hit him back as hard as he came at me. But since I didn't do that, you know, I didn't respond to his emotion. I read deeper into it and um I knew that there was a there was a f- bigger problem, and uh, unlike your situation where you were able to figure it out right then, it was a few weeks later pulling him out, talking to him, trying to ask him about his day or whatever, kind of you know knock down that wall a little bit. Where he said uh, like, "Well, I already learned you can't trust teachers," and I was like, "Okay, well now we are getting somewhere. It's not the phone; it's that mm-hmm. he is looking for a fight, trust, trust and, and mm-hmm. he doesn't think he can trust me." Mm-hmm. Kind, kind kind of deal so yeah yeah there there's always there's always something there's always something deeper yeah uh like nine times out of ten like i i and i have another student who um 
is always giving me all types of trouble and it's because she's always skipping my class so i always call home i always call home because she's always skipping my class and then she gets upset because i called home so then she skips my class and like so we're like in this little feedback loop that i'm trying to figure out how to break but it's like i'm not going to respond to her emotion because she's always trying to get under my skin and the best way she can think of to get under my skin is to skip my class or to be disrespectful or whatever Mm -hmm. but i don't ever meet her back with that yelling or whatever Mm -hmm. you know the power of not yelling which we've kind of talked about before so pratt what do you think about any of that well it just it reminds me and i constantly am reminded of this in every one of these situations and i think this is so true is that the way people treat you is a reflection of the way they feel about themselves and so if you can look past the immediate way they they act and go like they're responding out of a place of themselves not out of the me or the situation you know and i think that's that's also true for ourselves like you know there are lots of times when i'm frustrated you know like with my kids and then i maybe gripe at them or fuss at them and then i realize i'm not even upset with them i'm just upset with what's going on with me right now you know Mm -hmm. or whatever the case may be so i think if we can remember that so whenever we can take a step back and really start observing our students it gives us a lot of insight it gives us insight like you've just talked about into you know maybe their thoughts and and their emotions and their feelings their day even but i also think that it can give insight into like their motivation right so whenever you start just like sitting back and watching kids if you see a kid that's always on video games every time they have the opportunity whatever that may be then that gives you a little insight it's not oh, this kid's just wasting time or whatever. It's that that's what they enjoy. And how can you use that to your advantage in the classroom? You know, mm-hmm. uh, I mean, you can think of any example. You know, that's that's true. I have a student in my AV class and he is like unhealthily involved in video games. Mm-hmm. Like he definitely has some type of social issues going on and he retreats into his video games. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, getting him to record himself for our first video was out of the question. Like mm-hmm. I knew that he wasn't going to get behind the camera. But when I tr- when I transformed the assignment to you are going to do a tutorial over your favorite video game and how to play it mm-hmm. and you're going to do a voiceover and your face isn't even going to be on there. He immediately was like, oh, well, yeah, that's cool. Let's do that. Let's yeah. make that happen. Right. You know? Yeah. And so I, so I by, got him on board. Yeah. So through that observation, you were able to reach him and get the assignment done and so that he learned. You know, and that's what we're talking about. So in addition to to those things, I think it can also give you motivation into these two things, which I think are really, really helpful as an educator is their learning style. And then that kind of bleeds over into like maybe their intelligence, like what kind of intelligence they are. And, And we've kind of mentioned on this before, but, you know, Howard Gardner came up with these nine intelligences. Um, you know, whether it's naturalist, musical, logical, mathematical, existential, there's all these different ways that people can be Mm -hmm. smart and none Mm -hmm. of them are better than the other. It's just, that's how they're wired to think. So I I love that because like, for example, strangely enough, like I've spent most of my time in fine arts and I've spent most of my time in, um, you know, music, but music, I would say is one of my intelligences, but I don't think it's my strongest intelligence. Yeah. You know, like actually I'm way more linguistically strong. Like I really like words and meaning behind words and the power of words and like what you said and how you said it and why you said it. You know, that is how I learn better than even music. So sometimes it's a little surprising. That's true. Yeah. So sometimes it surprises you because you would think, hey, this kid's really good at playing an instrument. So he must be a musical learner. Not necessarily. It doesn't mean that he can't learn musically. But what's really interesting is that any kid can learn any of those ways. So it's a matter of like honing in on what is naturally their strength and then catering some of your um, activities to that sort of thing. And so that's like a whole different discussion for a whole different podcast that we'll probably do at some point because it's really fascinating. But that being said, you don't get to that point of being able to differentiate your instruction until you've been observant, until you've really watched your kids and how they interact and what they do. Mm -hmm. So were you going to say something? Well, yeah, I was going to say that their learning style and then also like the the quality of their work Mm -hmm. can also tell you a lot about it. So like that first student who I told you about who like doesn't really trust uh, teachers and stuff. I was watching him work in Photoshop. I was watching him draw his pictures and do his edits and do all these things. And he was so 
very meticulous. Like he didn't stop until he drew a straight line. And then when I showed him, like, you didn't have to try to draw a straight line with just the mouse, like there were shortcuts to it or whatever. He went, you know, forward with it. And then I realized like this kid's really smart. He knows exactly what he wants and he knows exactly what he wants and like how he wants to do it, which was probably one of the reasons why he gets friction with other teachers because he wants to learn and he thinks he knows the best way to learn for him. Mm-hmm. And he doesn't want to do it the, the teacher way. He wants to do it his way kind of deal. And when I've, I've, I've started to kind of expand on that with that student. And I think that I'm making some ground with that, with that relationship, but, uh, you can even look at your own personal work. Like, how do you work? Like, like think about when you wrote your last lesson plan. I know that none of us have probably ever written a lesson plan, but think about like, <laughs> who if has you time did. to write a What's lesson that? plan? What's right? that? <laughs> but think about like, if you did, like, I know the, my process to do that is messy, man. Like I have a piece of paper and I write what I, what we suck at. And I just like write down like all the Everything. things that the, the kids are not doing well. And then I'm like what we are good at. And I write down everything that we're good at. And then I try to, I kind of connect the dots and try to connect to see like, so that way the lessons balance between things that they're good at and things that they're bad at. Mm-hmm. And then like, then I go to my teaks and, you know, and I do all these things before I know it, I have all these sticky notes and all of these things. And then I have one paper maybe of exactly what needs to happen or all of all these things. So that's me. I'm all about just throwing my ideas out, but not everyone's like that. And I, when I stopped to observe myself to see how I learned, it made things a lot better. It showed me my strengths, my weaknesses and my insecurities. Yeah. You're right. It's one thing like just came to my mind. I know we're like talking about like the teacher too, but, um, this is, uh, recent information um it's a colleague of mine maybe having an issue like this problem connecting with the kid so i sat colleague down and i said here's what i think your issue is um i think you're you're having a connection issue because you don't see the kids mm-hmm. and it, it didn't sit with them i said does that does that make sense and it didn't really make sense i said you don't see them and that I had to kind of break it down. And that means um, you see them not only just for the student that's in your class that has to follow your rules and have to, you know, do the things to make, mm. not make that you good, but, you know, like to, to make them successful. But yeah. you see them as a person and you see that they have other things going on. You see that their emotions are different. You see that they have like growth or like you can tell that something's different about them, mm-hmm. you know, and you mention it um, that like every day you see them and not a student, you know, because they will be they're a person first. You know, they're mm-hmm. students, what they're doing right now, but they will matriculate through high school and do your, your class and then, you know, whatever. But I think that they will be successful as as they know that you see them, I'm gonna go with my voice, that you see mm-hmm. them uh, and not just a student. And I, I've i noticed, I've done a lot of things like in class, if I can't go over to a student and do whatever, I would just give like a, a nod. Mm-hmm. I just like, you know, like a nod, like, hey, like I see you, or like quick salute or like a, mm-hmm. you know, a head nod or something like that, just so they know like in that day, you know what? I might have had a chance to go and like have a conversation with you, which I try to do that. Um, but I, I see you and I see you here, you know, and that makes a huge, huge difference. You know, golly, that totally reminds me. Do you remember that old commercial that used to come on and it was like a commercial about a skin disorder and everybody was taking this medicine for the skin disorder. And so they would walk around and they would say, see me. And they would like hold up a sign that says, see me. And it was like, the whole point was like, don't look at my skin, but like, look at me as a person. Oh, right. Do you remember that commercial? No. Mm-hmm. No. Oh, was it, was, like the, it was. Was that like in the 30s? Whenever you were in high school? Yeah. Was that like 30s or 40s? <laughs> no, it was like within a few, probably like five years ago. Okay. I I did not remember. I mean, it sounds like a great concept. Okay. If you've seen that commercial, please please give us a comment. Like email us at info at teachbigger.com. I need to make sure that I'm not the only person that saw this great commercial. But it was good. Speaking of which, so I okay. Uh-huh. I don't know exactly how how this was worded, but it made an effect on me. There is a great movie. Tom Hanks is an amazing actor. Okay, about the Mitchell, the Mister Rogers movie. Oh yeah, I haven't seen it. Is it yeah, good? yeah, okay, I seen it. okay, well, I, I, okay, I got it. I was like, oh, this can't be that interesting, right? 
but it's so much about like how he treats people, how he makes people feel, you know? Uh huh. Uh, and it was one part in the movie, and then it was like, you know, the most important thing to me right now. And then he said the guy's name, I forgot the name, is, you know, you, you know, right now you're the most important thing, you know? Uh -huh. And then like when I was watching that, I was like, that's so important because it, uh, he's showing like it doesn't because, you know, Mr. Rogers, he was like super busy, he had like a crazy busy schedule uh -huh. and whatever, you know, and they had to like track him down and, you know, but like he was a, you know, he was like a reporter and he was saying right now, like you're the most important thing to me right now. And he kind of just paused for a second. And that, you know, that made him feel valued because someone who's so busy, you know, whatever, took the time to say, like, I say, I see you, you know? Yeah. And that made me think about that going into the game. Because I saw that in the summertime. I'm like, that's great. That's a great thing to like take with you Man. as a teacher. You know, that, see the kids. That is, and let me tell you something. Like Mr. Rogers, okay, so here a couple of weeks ago, I found this clip through Twitter and I retweeted it, right? And it's it's um, about a six minute maybe video of Fred Rogers going before the Congress or Congress right. or something. It, it was like, yeah, something like that, where he's asking them for the funding to continue his programming. And if you want to find out the heart of Mr. Rogers and what his purpose was, watch that little six minute or whatever clip. And it it literally shook me to the core. Like it was such a powerful clip and the things that he said so if you want to go to my twitter account uh the teach bigger twitter account actually is where it is so it's at teach bigger and you can scroll through my post or whatever I, I it's on like there stuff, it's really it good. is I'll, so I'll powerful it. it is so good but yeah so i mean because a lot of times as teachers we don't see our students as kids mm -hmm. we we see them as the subject matter we see them as the assignment and and it's not that any of us intend, the data the yeah, data the data and we don't intend mm -hmm. to do that but it's so easy so there's so much power in sitting back and just observing your kids and observing them as people not mm -hmm. as um, product number ID yeah. ID right. number mm -hmm. so and I, I I think that it's it it's also valuable after you're if you're already viewing your kids as like an actual person then it can help you help them even further become a person. Because mm -hmm. I know that like, especially in this time, day and age, like the social skills of students is not good. No. <laughs> it, it's not good. Like, I mean, you can, you swipe right in order to get anything from a boyfriend, girlfriend to, to your pizza. Right. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. <laughs> so the, the social cues and things right. and, and the, the concept of small talk and, and cooperation is really kind of lost. And a lot of times I like to stand in front of my class when I've given them a group assignment and I'll sit there and I'll watch it. I'll be like, Ooh, this is bad. Like they don't know how to interact with each other. So then I have to go in and I don't go into those groups to stimulate the content. Mm -hmm. I go in those groups to stimulate the conversation. So that way they feel comfortable with one another. Yeah. Cause the, uh, I am so against the, well, we need a facilitator and let's get a timer, a timekeeper, and then we'll get this person and assigning jobs to all the – no. Like that's not – that. I could go on a two-hour spiel about why that's not good. But what is good is understanding how to cooperate somebody and how to get on that level of, of comfortability with another person because then you are going to just naturally rise to whatever your strength is. Yeah. And then when I do that, my groups do way better. And it's not just one kid doing all of the work or anything like that. Yeah. So I think it's important to look at those social cues. And if your kids aren't doing well with it, then, you know, ma make a joke out of it. Either do it to them, what they're doing to everybody else. Be like, oh, yeah, that's awkward. Maybe you shouldn't do that. You know what I mean? Right. Something like that. I, I think that's important. Well, yeah. I mean, because for the most part, even from, from elementary school all the way to high school, I feel like we have the responsibility to teach them how to interact socially, peer interaction, because they don't know. And the examples that they see, I mean, think about it. The examples that they see, maybe they have a good example at home, but nine times out of 10, I don't think they do. And then mm -hmm. where are they getting it from? The media. Well, who mm -hmm. can trust anything? Mm. You know? So, I mean, it's like, do we want our kids to emulate what they see in media and what they see at home? Or do we have the opportunity to shape a culture 
because we are investing and taking time to teach them things like compassion and empathy and teach them things like cooperation and, you know, whatever the case may be. So uh, educators, you cannot get into this thinking, I'm just going to teach math or I'm just going to teach biology or I'm only going to teach second grade, whatever that is. Like you're going to teach children. And along Mm. with teaching children comes the responsibility of teaching them how to think, how to interact, and how to, you know, be, how to be. Look, and I I call it hollow teaching or being a hollow teacher. That means that you show up, you teach the content, but the kids have no idea who you are. They don't Mm -hmm. know anything about you. You are just this hollow shell that comes up there and just feeds them content. And that's not good because think about it. Who are they really going to emulate? Their parents or the person who they are seeing for nine hours of the day, five days out of the week for 12 years. Yeah. Right? You know what I'm saying? I'm not saying – not discrediting parents because you know they definitely are the core of, of things. But you are much more of an influence than you actually think and they're not getting the social cues and social uh, – observations with their parents if anything kids act way different at school than they do with their parents because they think they can't be themselves or you know or all these other types of all these other types of things so i think it's important for you to make sure that you teach with your personality and then it it bleeds over to the kids you know you know what i'm saying yeah and and i i guess the last little thought on that is i think as as teachers we can't be afraid to be honest and to be real with kids and i mean i learned that lesson even this week you know because i'm at a new school and i've everything's going great with the exception of my one class of eighth graders because they've not you know it's it's new for them like i'm a new person they have the same band director for three years but they only had a band director for two years and now there's somebody new and that's Mm -hmm. trying to get them to do something very different you know Mm -hmm. and we've had a lot of trouble connecting but lately i've just been extremely real with them and honest and you know just kind of opened up about my thinking and what they're doing well and what they're not doing well and just being real and saying like You know, how do we fix this? And we've been kind of working toward getting things better. And, you know, it touched my heart today. I had a student come and give me a a little handwritten letter of words of kindness. And it was like, you're my favorite teacher and I love this class. Thank you. And I'm like, okay, I got through to one. I finally got through to one, you know. And and you just got to do it moment by moment. And honestly, that kid never says a word. I would have never guessed, you know. He just kind of stares at me. We're proud of you. Yeah, you know, success. So... Last, you must listen to our podcast. I did. I listened to a couple of episodes, and it really helped me. So if Look, you, there you go. T- uh, Pratt's teaching bigger. That's Hashtag right. I teach bigger. Hashtag I teach bigger. Yay. So, so good. I, last little thought I would say about this, about observing students, is I think it also gives us a lot of insight into their strengths and their weaknesses, and probably most importantly, their insecurities. And I think that if we can be careful of those things, and if we can play to their strengths, and then encourage their weaknesses and avoid their insecurities, we will really get a lot of buy-in from our students, and we're going to help get that content to them. Mm-hmm. So anything else on that? No, that's good. no uh, I'm good. Let's... Steven. Okay, so oh. Oh. <laughs> last, um, last thing we kind of want to cover in this episode is there's also some power in observing yourself, mm. right? Like literally observing ourselves, like kind of stepping out and looking like, why do I feel this way? How do I feel? Why am I doing this? Why am I responding this way? And we have to be intentional about that. If not, we just kind of ride in that wheel of emotions all the time. And then we end up doing things and saying things that we look back and go, why did I do that? Instead Mm -hmm. of stopping and saying, what is happening? What's making me do this? Why am I acting this way? Why am I responding this way? Because as teachers, if you've done this for more than a week, you've done something that you're like, I wish I wouldn't have done that. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. and it's an emotional response. And so sometimes we have to take a step and and observe that. So go ahead, Mosley. No, so so, so, okay. With this, when we're in the moment, we're driving instruction. We have our intentions behind it. And like you're caught up in the moment. And sometimes... Uh, you're not able to 
see, I guess in real time, uh, what's going on in the room sometimes. So like one thing that we recommend is to video yourself teaching or in the classroom or teach a lesson. And this is a very scary thing to do um, because the video uh, doesn't hide anything and you have to face some insecurities about yourself. Um, and, you know, we think that we do certain things at a certain level sometimes and then you see the video and it's like, it's, it's not the case. Uh, so I think like while my first 10 years, I had to fail myself like once or twice. Um, and that was going into grad school. But in grad school, uh, where I think I really got better, is we had to film ourselves in front of a group every day. Like that was part of what we had to do. And then with my professor, we would sit there and like talk about it. And this is a, a personal thing. What I what I realized is some of the things that I thought was going on, they were not really going on. It was not in my head, but even not at the same level. And so what I wanted to do, like my intention was there, but it was not actually in practice. Um, and so what I wanted to do and the goal is to close the gap. And I noticed like why, why didn't things happen? It's because either I presented it not the right way or either my gesture, my demand or my questioning was not there. Um, or I don't know, my flow is it, a lot of different reasons why things didn't happen. Mm -hmm. So as I, you know, watch video, which was hard, <laughs> and then I would go and like make make little tweaks and things like that. As I would go back, I would notice that those things that I, you know, saw in the video, I would, you know, close the gap a bit more and close the gap a bit more. And so whenever I was in front of a group and teaching my teaching my lesson or whatever, the gap from intention to actual realization closed, you know, and I don't think it'll ever be just totally closed, but, you know, it went, it definitely increased substantially, but I watched video every day of when I was in front of a group, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and so it hurt, but it helped in the long run. It, it reminds me just real quick of when I was in college <laughs> and I was convinced that I was playing something correctly. And my professor kept telling me, this is not right. This is not good. And I go, I know that I'm doing it right because you have to do A, B, C, and D. And I knew all the answers because I'm a really strong teacher and I knew how to teach it. I knew fundamentally, foundationally what had to happen. He goes, you're correct, but you're not doing that. And I'm like, yes, I am. He's like, have you, have you recorded yourself? And I was like, no. He's like, record yourself. And so sure enough, I recorded myself and I listened back and I wasn't doing anything that I thought I was doing. But because in my brain, I knew what to do. I was assuming that I was doing it correctly, but I wasn't listening. I wasn't observing myself. Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot of times that happens to us as teachers. We know what we're supposed to do. So our assumption is that we're doing that. But then when you go back and really watch, you go, oh, I kind of do waste a lot of time. Or mm -hmm. maybe I do let those kids in the back of the room talk the whole time and they're completely off task. <laughs> Yeah. Like, you know, because then that doesn't lie to you. So I think yeah. that that is such an important practice because you start to kind of see where things don't line up with reality. And so here's the thing, too. I don't know if you remember this. I, st I stopped doing this when I work with you, Brad. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like when we're in front of the group and we're like. We're working on a piece of music, right? Uh -huh. And we are humming it at the same time as they're playing oh, yeah. it. Yeah. You know, it's like that's adding to what we know needs to be in our head. And it's like, wait, I'm like humming. And I so that means I'm having the experience and what's what they're playing is not what needs to happen. And, and me humming is kind of interfering with that. So stop. You know, I was like, stop humming. You right. know, we want to hum because humming makes us feel like it's going right. You know, it's uh -huh. better. It's like soothing. <laughs> it it's soothing to your soul. Yeah. And so if you don't hum, you can hear everything. So right. uh, that's another part, because like we're in the moment, too. So I told our kids, like, hey, listen, like when we go to contests or, you know, I'm on the stage with y'all. Like, this is our experience together, you know. Um, but I just think that as educators, sometimes we're like so connected to like how we're, you know, our lesson and how things are going, you know, like mm -hmm. in the moment, you know, mm -hmm. we're our own cheerleader. And then you have to get out of it so you can see, oh, you know, that really didn't go like I thought it was going, you right. know. So, uh, yeah, go ahead. You know, I was just talking about like, and also like the video part of it, you uh -huh. know, uh, 
also whenever you're in it you have emotions you know frustrations excitement you see the passion or whatever uh-huh. and sometimes you're in the moment so you don't see it you know whenever you watch the video i i encourage you to observe your emotions mm-hmm. okay observe your uh, emotions to things that go well things that don't go well and then also observe your emotion and how the kids react to your emotion yeah mm-hmm. that's good because what i because what i noticed is giving instruction when i came from a you know a place more centered you know even if i felt frustrated with it if i came as like a pretty calm response to it i got a better response from the students because they're responding to my information and not my emotion you know and i'm not saying be non-emotional but sometimes the kids they respond to your emotion and not mm-hmm. the information so you kind of it's kind of a never-ending circle you know like yeah. i'm frustrated because you didn't do it and then they they don't give you what you want because they're only responding to you being upset and then you keep going over and over again so you kind of have to kind of take your emotions out of it mm-hmm. and then be able to give inf- direct information so they respond to the content not the emotion yeah and that came after watching many videos about you know mm-hmm. you know responding to things so yeah. i would observe your emotion yeah and i think the last thing about observing what we're doing you know we're talking about videotaping ourselves and and observing us and and what we're doing I think also it helps you to see if you're making the most of your time because a lot of times when you step back and watch what's happening, you realize, oh, that transition just took five minutes or whatever the case may be. And suddenly you realize like, I got to fix those procedures or I've got to fix this classroom culture right here so that I'm not wasting this time every day because we're taking way too much time to do our warm up or whatever the case may be. And sometimes you don't see that because your mind is thinking so many things in those gaps that you don't feel like it was a waste of time. But from a student perspective, I've been sitting here, you know? So those are some things that I think you can also pick up on by observing your practice. So, so lastly, I think we need to talk about observing our emotions, right? Because there's the actual actions that we're doing, but then there's emotions that are involved with those things. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I like what you guys said the other day. It's about taking yourself out of the equation and remembering that they're kids. Yeah. And, and I think that there's, there's a lot of strength in that, especially, well, I shouldn't say especially, I mean, whether it's elementary school, middle school or high school, because they all have their own challenges. So Mm -hmm. Whichever the case may be, remembering that they're kids. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that I mean that really <laughs> helps me, especially with like making sure I don't yell or anything like that. Because it, it's probably because I'm getting older myself, and uh, I don't feel like, especially when I first started teaching, when I first started like going out or whatever, and like helping out with schools, or whatever. I felt way more connected to the kids because, like, you know, I was closer in age. But now there's a good like 10 almost 15 year gap between me and the students and it helps me when they do something crazy that i just remind myself they're still in high school or Mm -hmm. they're still in junior high Mm -hmm. they're still figuring it out Mm -hmm. me yelling at them is just going to make them have a bad memory that they're going to sit around with their family when they're like 40 years old and talk Mm -hmm. about mr lamont and like whatever and i'm like i don't want that Mm -hmm. so like i'll let them act up I'll talk to them later. I'll call the AP. I'll call like whatever, but I'm not going to lose my cool. You know right. what I mean? Well, yeah. and that that's one of the things that I kind of struggle with because I'm a very reflective person. You know, like, so in other words, something will happen in class and I'll respond and do whatever. And then like when it's over and I decompress and I think through it all, I'm like, I shouldn't have done that or I should have done this or whatever. And so one of the things that I'm working on is this observation skill of like reading the situation beforehand and then kind of uh, having a plan before I react. And it all happens really fast. And I think it has to come with practice because, you know, this is, you got to kind of fine tune this skill. But being able to read the situation, and Mosley's really good at this. So being able to read the situation and making sure that I'm going to respond not out of emotion, but out of what is best for the kid. And Mm -hmm. that's a learned thing. Like it takes some time, but unless you're observing yourself and how you feel and why you feel that way, it's hard to move past that and not be emotional. Mm -hmm. I had a, the, my second year after Pratt decided to leave me and, um, I, (laughs) (laughs) the, head director then i had a a first year assistant you know and 
the kids just like she was an emotional person, mm-hmm. you know, uh, and she just would cry, yeah. you know. Uh, you know, and I, sometimes she's like, "I don't even know why." I, she's like, "I don't know why I'm crying," and I, and I I try to help her put things in perspective. And just like the kid, their kid, you know, I said, "Hey, listen, don't let them like get to you." I said, "Some of them still use the restroom on themselves." <laughs> and I, and she looked at me and she was crying at this point. I said, "Do you hear what I said?" I said, "Some of them still they they use the restroom on themselves, so don't <laughs> don't let an eleven year old, you know, like." change your day and like make you emotional and cry you know i was like mm-hmm. your face is all red you know what i'm saying so and whenever i said that she was like you're right i'm like so they're just they're just kids so not just kids but they're kids you know right. so and they're just they're gonna do what they're gonna do and you can't let them change your you know change your day so that that'll put things into perspective for you yeah right and yeah and i think it's important to also think about not just like observing your emotions with other students, but observing your emotions with other teachers. Because I think we can all agree that sometimes, most of the time, the hardest part of our day is not the kids. It's working with other teachers. Yeah, And yeah. That, I think that's it's probably its, its own podcast altogether. Yeah. But let me just say that th- I think, because this is something I've been working on at least since last year. And I really feel like I made headway with it. Uh, last year, I had a bunch of disagreements with other teachers uh, that were in and out of my discipline. And what I decided to do was I wasn't I was going to let I was going to let it go. I was going to let it play out because I knew that there was no sense of, of getting angry about it. And if you've never done that before, I don't know if you're like me, but you can tell if you've done it because you'll get this nice, nasty knot right around your neck because all of it just kind of <laughs> pins up like right there. Uh, it'll go away eventually as, you know, you kind of. That's know. what that knot was. I thought you were like a humpback. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. That was just all my hatred and frustration with other teachers. <laughs> your hatred hump. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I think that's important to do. And I think. At the end of the ordeals that were going on, uh, because once COVID hit, it, none of it really mattered anymore. Right, exactly. Um, I felt so accomplished as a person because I never gave them and I told you so. I didn't fight them on it. I felt like I stayed professional throughout the entire thing. They stayed professional too. It's not like it was like a, a heated thing, but it never got heated because I never took it to that place. And I'm pretty sure it would have gotten – that way if i would have taken it there just like with a student that student's acting up they're expecting you to yell so observe your uh, observe their emotions observe your emotions and keep them in check and, and respond accordingly yeah that's good always they're always caught off guard when you don't yell that makes a bigger impression yeah yes yes it does so i i think to me this is kind of the wrap up here you know Yes, it's extremely important that we observe other teachers and learn from them, okay? And it's a, it's important to let others observe you and give you feedback, too. And we didn't really talk about that, but that is, that's big. About that. But also, learning to observe our students and learning to observe ourselves. I think that when we can step out and look at all three of these situations, it is going to directly impact the way we're able to teach kids. And we have to remember that social and emotional learning is the key. It's the foundation. Building these relationships and reaching these kids and building the culture in our classroom where every kid is able to learn and we're able to teach them. That is that is the power of it. And your content doesn't do that. It's your culture that does that. And so that's key. And and I mean, I just I feel this way. Like if we don't understand the people in the room, we'll lose the people in the room. And so it's so mm-hmm. important that we work just as hard to reach them as we do to give them the content. Because people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. That is exactly right. So, Oh, Mosley, that's good. We're going to post that on Instagram. You can't. That's, that's somebody else's quote. <laughs> we'll, we'll figure it out. We'll, post we'll put, it. Just put in quotations. <laughs> right, just put in quotations. So if you know who said that quote, we'll do a little research. Yeah. But if you know who said that quote, let us know. Uh, no, I can't. I've never, I've never said that. I mean, it's not like we, you know, have Google or anything. Right. So, well, thanks for listening today. I hope that you've enjoyed this two-part episode. And like I said, 
yeah, if you didn't get a chance to listen to the first part, definitely go back and check it out. Also want to encourage you to subscribe to the podcast so that way you get notified. We have new episodes every Monday and Wednesday. So definitely want to get you involved. Also, reach out to us if you have an idea for a podcast um, episode, a topic, if you have a question, or you just want to give us some feedback. Definitely give us a review um, in the podcast, but also you can just email us at info at teachbigger.com. Also, you can reach out to us on social media. Tyler, tell them all about how to do it. So we have social media now. We have uh, we have a Twitter, so you can add us at Twitter, or um, or you can uh, you know slide in those DMs on Twitter, or slide in our DMs over in uh, Instagram. Yeah, uh, we're our Instagram's pretty new, so go tell your friends. It's uh, Teach Bigger. The hashtag is I Teach Bigger. So if you are doing something really cool in your classroom, let us know. Take a picture of it. Or something like that. Maybe take a picture of your desk so that way we can see how messy it is or how clean it is. I teach bigger. Hashtag I teach bigger. It's great. You should go follow us at teach bigger. Yeah. So so <laughs> on, on Instagram and on Twitter, it's both at teach bigger. So we're easy to find. Come right. on and join us. We want we want you to follow. So anyways, thanks for listening. Again, reach out to us. We're looking forward to it. So we'll see you next time. <laughs>